So for everybody out in the audience, uh, continuing on with our outstanding guest speaker series, today the TMCC Library Open Virtual Genealogy Lab is pleased to present Carol Costecos Petronic. Uh, Carol serves as an assistant director of the Washington DC Family History Center, where she coordinates classes, conferences, and community outreach projects. She is a volunteer at the National Archives in Washington, DC, and serves as a genealogy aide in the research room. Carol is affiliated with Family Search on several initiatives, including a digitization project at the Maryland Archives and with My Heritage on record acquisitions in Greece. Carol is an active member of the Greek genealogy community and shares her knowledge by contributing a Greek online, oh, excuse me, by contributing to Greek online associations, teaching at local and national conferences and blogging. Carol writes, edits and publishes personal and family histories and is a frequent speaker at genealogy organization. Today, her presentation is titled, titled Alien Registration Files, and she's going to be talking about the Alien Registration Act of 1940, uh, and it was a World War II national security measure which directly impacted immigrants who planned to remain in the U.S. for 30 days or longer. Aliens were issued a card which they had to carry at all times. Files have extensive genealogical information such as naturalization documents, photographs, affidavits, correspondence and application documents which were completed by the alien. This presentation will examine this often overlooked resource, resource which may be the key to finding an immigrant ancestor's original surname and village of origin. So without further ado, I'd like to turn everything over to Carol. Welcome, Carol. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. And uh, let's see, let's go here. I'm sharing my screen and sorry, let's just make sure. Okay, Suzanne, can you see this? Yes, I just turned off my microphone, but I just turned it back on. Yes, it's coming across loud and clear and very clear. Okay, oh, great. Also, also, could you turn, uh, Carol, could you see that little icon at the bottom where it says, oh, yes. uh, Blue Team is sharing your screen. If you could just click on hide. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Suzanne, if at some point you need to um, interrupt me, um, excuse me, I don't see the chat because I have my presentation on full screen. So if there's a question or if for some reason my audio or video isn't coming through correctly, if you could just interrupt, then that way I'll know that there's a problem and we can stop and correct it. Thank you. Will do. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. I'm in the Washington, D.C. area, so for me it's afternoon and it's a beautiful day here. Sun is shining, the world looks gorgeous, and yet our lives have changed so completely. Um, but I am so happy to be here today to talk to you about these alien registration files. As you heard in the introduction, my family is Greek, my family's from Sparta, Greece. And consequently, the research that I am doing is not only in the old country of Greece, but also in the United States, as my grandparents and their uh, cousins and siblings emigrated during that great wave of immigration that took place uh, in the early 1900s. They came to this country and they became citizens. So consequently, my research a majority of my research in the United States is on naturalization records, passenger ship records, and now these alien registration files. And I'm very excited to share with you the things that I've learned in working in this collection. So I would like for you to meet my grand aunt. Her name is Bertha Costianis. She was an alien and she has a file. You can see this photo of Bertha, and you can see her signature um, on the left-hand side of the picture, and you will see where we got this photo from. So, A-files, or alien registration files, what exactly are they? When the United States um, entered World War II, there was a lot of concern about the huge numbers of people in this country who were not U.S. citizens. So the government passed the Alien Registration Act of 1940 as a security measure. According to this act, any individual in this country who was 14 years old or older and who was going to remain in this country for more than a month 
had to register at a local post office and also had to be fingerprinted within 30 days of arrival. Now, if you look at this picture in the lower part of your screen, these, this is a picture from the National Archives of people lining up to get fingerprinted. The government took this very seriously. Everybody had to register if they were not a United States citizen. And what these A files had, have done is they were able to have the government know exactly where the alien, who the aliens were, where they lived, and basically all of their movement within the United States up until the time they became naturalized citizens, up until the time they became permanent residents, or up until the time they were deported. So basically, it was a tracking mechanism and a very effective one. Over five and a half million aliens were registered between 1940 and 1944. So if you have an ancestor that was in this country by 1940 who was not a citizen, they had an alien registration card and possibly may have a file. After 1944, 60 million people, 60 million A-files were created. Now, what would it take to actually have a file open? A file was open. There are not 60 million A-files that the government has right now. Many of these people did not have to have an actual file created for them. But if they came back to the government for any reason, while they were still an alien, a file was opened for them. And you were going to see some examples of that today in the documents that I'm going to show you. Aliens had to report their address on a regular basis to the government. They had to report every January, even if they had not moved during that year, they would go to their post office, fill out a form, and that would be sent to what is now USIS or what was back then INS. There is an article from the National Archives Magazine prologue uh, called A-Files, which should have been sent to you along with the handout that I created for this class. So please be sure that you take a look at that article. It's fascinating and it's interesting, and there's so much more in that article than I have time to discuss today. One of the things in that article is this chart which gives a description of who the immigrant might be on the left-hand side of the screen and on the right-hand side, whether or not they would have an A-file or an alien registration number. I'm not going to go over each of these categories, but let's focus on the one that's in red. Most people registered in the United States as an alien in 1940 but they never went back to INS for any reason. In other words, there was no reason for them to go back to the government and make any other kind of contact. No requests, no problems that they were dealing with. Um, they just filled out their form and that was it. If that is your person, then yes, look on the right hand side, they will have an alien registration number, but they will not have a file. Now, my grand aunt Bertha, she registered in the U.S. in 1940, but she went back to INS for several reasons, meaning she had to fill out forms, she had to fill out paperwork. Therefore, she does have an A file. So if your ancestor does or doesn't have an A file, if they were an alien, they definitely registered, but if they never went back to the INS for any reason, then they most likely would not have a file. So how do you know if your ancestor was a possibility of either being an alien or having an A file? The best place to look is the 1940 census. Remember, this was implemented in 1940, 
and the 1940 census and all censuses are usually taken in the springtime around April, May, June, this time of year. So consequently, I have blown up this particular um, uh, 1940 census to show you this area of the census record that many people overlook. It has to do with immigration naturalization information. And you can see in the red box, citizenship of the, pers of the foreign born person. And you see NA, which means naturalized. And underneath that, you see AL, which means alien. If you have an ancestor in the US in 1940, and you find them on this 1940 census, and they have the word AL next to their name, they had to register with the government as an alien, and they definitely had an alien registration number. But perhaps they did not have a file. So what is in these files that makes them so important for people, especially for those who are researching our immigrant ancestors? They have an incredible amount of genealogical information, which includes the documents that you see on the screen photograph, naturalization, all kinds of applications, marriage documents, birth documents. There might be affidavits from friend and family members who are attesting to one fact or another. And they would also have the report card, the one that they had to fill out every year to tell the government where they were located. So basically, what an A file is for a genealogist is one-stop shopping you can find out almost anything that you would want to know about your immigrant ancestor if they have an A-file. Bertha's A-file was 48 pages, 48 documents that she filled out and completed because of various reasons that she was going back and forth to the government. Among the documents in this file is this Certificate of Naturalization. This was only given, created, and given to the individual himself or herself when they became a naturalized citizen. But this document is duplicated if the person has an A file. And if you look at the top of the document, it says the word duplicate to be forwarded to uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service. So the original resided with Bertha, and hopefully some member of her family has it now. No, hopefully nobody threw it away. So this one that's in her file is a duplicate. And these are treasures. Uh, they usually have the photo of our immigrant ancestor, their signature, and just some very, very basic information about them, including when and where they became US citizens. This particular document is the form that was filled out for Bertha in order for her to get her alien registration number. So it is the alien registration form. And I'd like to show you some things on this form that we are finding with our immigrant ancestors and that most likely you're finding as well, which is information that is different from document to document, different birth dates, different names, different places where they were born or when they came into the US. This information can drive us crazy as researchers because we want to know the proof, we want the exact information. But when we get into documents that our immigrant ancestors have filled out or have created themselves, we begin to see the variance in documents and in names, dates, and places in these documents that were created by the person giving the information. So that's what I want you to focus on in these forms. First of all, the type of information that's being asked and how the person responds to the questions. It's fascinating to see this. So if we look at line one, it says, my name is Bertha John Castianis. I entered the U.S. under the name of Bertha Manos. But she has also been known as Manos Costas Giannis. Now, 
if you think her name is Costianus, are you going to even know to try to look for her in documents under the name Costas or Manos? No, you're going to look for her under the name that you knew her as, which in this person's case was Costianus. So I'm getting a, uh, a hint from this document that this is not the only name she used in the U.S., and I need to start looking for her under other records with these names. She says here that she was born on March 20th, 1896. Well, we would think that somebody would know when they were born, but we're going to see that this date is not correct. She says she was born in Sparta, Tharpon. Yes, the city of Sparta, Greece exists. There is no place in Greece called Tharpon. She says she arrived September 13th on an English ship, but she doesn't know the name. Now, that was one document. This document and all the documents that I'm showing you today are in the files. So this is her petition for naturalization. Remember, we just saw her certificate. Well, in order to get that certificate, they, she had to uh, fill out some forms, including this petition for naturalization. On this petition, she tells us her name my full, true, and correct name is Bertha Costianus. But we saw it on the last document that she was using other names as well. Here, she said she was born February 20th, 1895 in Gorica, Sparta. But before, she told us she was born March 20th, 1896, so which is correct. The village of Gorica, I know from personal experience, is a village and it is outside of Sparta. On this petition, we have information about her husband, when he was born, when they were married, where and when he was naturalized. So for a genealogist, this is fabulous information because we're not only learning about the person of interest, we are learning about the spouse. And it gets better because here she lists the names of her children, the birth dates, birthplaces, and where they currently live. So we can see that she and John had Amanda, Helen, Galliopi, and Peter giving the birth dates and where they're currently residing as of the date that this document is signed. She says here that she arrived October 28, 1913, under the name of Bertha Costianus. But she told us on the alien registration form we just looked at, but she arrived September 1913, and she didn't know the name of the ship. Here, she signs her name as Bertha Costianus, and as genealogists, we know that whenever there's a discrepancy in a record, we should always look at how the person signs their name and take that as the proof that that is the way the person was known um, to the authorities and to family. Now, this document here is what she, the docu the information that she gave to prepare for that petition of naturalization that we just looked at. I'm gonna go back one screen because this is the petition that you can see it's all nicely typed out. Bertha provided the information on this document, which you can see is handwritten. Now, I want to show you this document in detail because all the information that she filled out on this three-page document is not on this final petition. When you go and find a petition for naturalization, this is what you're going to find. You are not ever going to find this document unless it happens to be in an alien registration file. So let's take a look at it a little bit more closely. The information at the top is the same as the, as the petition. And here, she's telling us that she was using the name Bertha Manos when she left from the US, uh, depart, excuse me, when she re, uh, came to the United States. She arrived in September 1913 on using the name Bertha Manos. This is page two of this document that was created for her petition. Look at this. 
it gives us her father's full name, her mother's maiden name, her birth village, what port she left at, the person who she was coming to the U.S. to be with, and where that person lived. Now, none of this information shows up in her petition for naturalization. As genealogists, it would take us tons of research to find an immigrant's father's name and mother's maiden name, but that is on this form. Also, what's interesting, look at towards the bottom here, the authorities were unable to verify that she was on the ship called the, excuse me, called the Pannonia that arrived on September 28, 1913. So we can see here the amount of information that these immigrants had to provide. There was a final hearing for Bertha for when she petitioned to become a citizen. And here is those documents are in the file as well. Here you can see on page two that she signed her name Pota Gostianus. But look on the left hand side of the screen where her name and address is filled out. Her name is Bertha Costianus. So again, you're beginning to see that to our immigrant ancestors, they may have been known by their original name in whatever language that was, an America, Americanized name, and also an abbreviated or a nickname of either their original birth name or their Americanized name. This document in Bertha's file is an application for information from immigration and naturalization records. Now, if you look at the very top, you see it's the Department of Justice INS service. So consequently, in this document, she is again giving more information about herself and when she arrived in the US. Here she's telling us that her ship name was the Pannonia, which remember she didn't know back when she first filled out her alien registration form, the first form we looked at. So why is she coming back to INS? This document tells us, look at number three, interest of applicant in subject matter applying for social security. So remember at the very beginning when we were talking and we saw that chart and there was a red box around the type of immigrant that would have an alien registration file would be an immigrant who came back to the INS for a specific reason. This is one of the documents that Bertha came back to the INS to get her information. She was applying for Social Security and she needed certain documentation that would allow her to fill that application out properly. So let's take a look at this document here. Now this is correspondence regarding her Social Security application. And let's take a look at it. Um, it's from the social uh, INS and they are writing, um, Bertha's writing to them. And she says in the first paragraph, I received your communication stating you have no record for Bertha Castianos, nay, meaning maiden name, Manos. Remember, we saw that name a couple of documents back. Now, she says, after reviewing some other old records, I find the name, instead of being Panayota Manos, as her maiden name, was probably under the Greek translation, which is Panayota Vulumanos, which is spelled one of two ways, or Bertha Manos, and she says she arrived on the ship Pannonia in 1913. This is the first document that we have that gives us her original name. Her original name in Greek is Banayota Vulumanos. It is not Banayota Manos. Costianos is her maiden name. And when she signed her name Pota in the document we were looking at just a moment ago, that's an abbreviation for her Greek name of Panayota. Here, Bertha filled out yet another document, and she wants to become a permanent residence in the United States. 
So because she's an alien, all these documents having to do with anything she's interacting with the government with is in her A file. So let's take a look at this one here. We have her name. Um, she says, uh, my name at given birth was Panayota A. Bulumanos. I entered the U.S. under the same name. Oh, really? I thought that she told us a couple of documents ago that she entered us under the name Bertha Costianos. So, if you were looking for Bertha Costianos in a passenger ship record, would you find her? No, because she did not come in under that name, even though she says she did. Her last place of residence is her village near Sparta. That's very helpful. Those of you that are researching overseas know that when you're looking for a village or a small township back in the early 1900s, that with border changes and with um, various administrative changes, a lot of these little villages went away and they, they disappeared. Or there could be more than one village with the same name in a, in a country, in fact, probably many villages with the same name. But in this document, I have come to learn that she is from Gorica near Sparta. So if there's any other Gorica in, in Greece, I do not, I know that she's not from there. I know exactly where she's from. So more information, um, each inf piece of information that we get helps us to distill what's the truth and what maybe the immigrant got confused or forgot. On this particular document, we are learning that she came over with two brothers and a friend of hers, Martha Andritsikis. So, looking for her on a passenger ship record, I would not only be looking for her, but I would be looking for brothers. And if I find two males traveling on the same ship that have that last name, I don't have to wonder if they're cousins. I would know from this document that she came with her brothers. So those are two more people that I can put on my family tree. In this particular document, which was uh, filed later than the earlier documents that we looked at, she's giving us the names of her daughters, but look, she's giving us their married names. And we all know how um, troubling and challenging it can be to find and trace women. But in this document, I can see each of the names of her daughters and how old they are and what their married names are and where they were living at that particular time. Now, underneath that, you can see several addresses. These are all the places that she lived in the United States and for how long she lived in each of those places. So again, being able to track her, I've, I have since found her passenger ship record. She didn't come in through Ellis Island. I had no idea that she was living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I always knew her when she was living in Princeton, which is here, the last place she lived because it's, it's at the top. So 10 Spring Street in Princeton is, this is my grandmother's um, uh, cousin. My grandmother lived in Princeton. Her cousin lived there. Other family members lived there. I would never have thought to look for Bertha in Philadelphia until I saw the documents that are in these files. Also in these files, you're going to find affidavits of witnesses. And as good genealogists, we know that we need to pay attention to witnesses because someone who comes to vouch for you could just be the person next door or it could be somebody who lived in your building or that you worked with. But oftentimes our immigrant ancestors wanted somebody that they knew and could trust to provide the accurate information for them. So if I wanted to do extensive research on Bertha, I would not only be researching her, but I would be researching anybody who was a witness for her. So this particular man's name is George Manusos. He's a janitor. Um, it gives us his residence. It tells us how long he lived in the U.S., how long he's known Bertha. And he also tells us that he did not see her when he was in the Army for three and a half months. 
So if George was somebody, a person of interest to me in Bertha's fan club, right away I have a clue from this document that he was in the army. So that's going to give me another resource to look for him in US military records. Here's another witness, Anastasios Hastroglis. He's retired, it gives us his residence. Again, it tells us how long he's known Bertha. And uh, he says that in late 1932, he went to Greece, she was in Princeton, and he did not see her for three months. So if Anastasios was a person of interest to me, this document is going to tell me that I need to start thinking he went to Greece. Okay, he would went to Greece, obviously he has family there, he has people there. Um, I would look for him in a passenger ship record coming back from Greece in the, into the U.S. because we do not have records from people leaving the U.S. going overseas. Our passenger ship records are those from people overseas coming into the U.S. But still, if I knew he was overseas, I could look for him in a passenger ship record and that could tell me a lot more information about where he was going and who he was going to see. Some other documents of Bertha's in this file. Look at this. This is her record of marriage, her civil record. Um, I see here that it tells us her name, her husband's name, where he was working, uh, the age of marriage, and uh, it tells us that it's a first marriage for both of them. It gives us his father and his mother's name and her father and her mother's name. Now I want you to look on the right hand column where it says for her father's name and her mother's name. See where it says Thomas Manos? Remember that Bertha's full name is Vuglu Manos. And of course that would be her father's name, but she would condense that name. She would shorten it and use the name Manos here in the US at times. So on her marriage record, she did not give her full name. She gave the abbreviated surname of Manos. So if I, let's say that I didn't have um, an alien registration file for Bertha where I'm finding all this other information. Let's say I just found this marriage record, which we're all excited to get. And I find her father's name on this marriage record. I'm going to want to look for a Thomas Manos somewhere in Greece. Hopefully there would be other information I would find for Bertha that would tell me where. And I would be looking and looking and looking for a Thomas Manos. But guess what? I would never find him because that's not the name. Also, take a look at the mother's maiden name, Calliope Costas. Uh, these names are not written properly either for the groom or for the bride on their uh, parents' names. The other documents in this file, there are actually three of these. These are Bertha's children's baptismal certificates in the Greek Orthodox Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Why these original records are in her A file and not with the family is beyond me, but here they are. Consequently, three out of her four children's records are here. Um, the beauty of finding a record that is uh, both in Greek and in the original language is you get to see how the names are spelled in the original language. So if you kind of look across these lines, you see the, the English is on the right and on the left is the Greek. So consequently, it says, um, this is to certify the legal spouse. See where it says John Costianus on the right, and on the left, it's, his name is written in Greek. Now, the beauty of this is that when I go to Greek records, I know exactly how to spell that name. And I know that this name in Greek is spelled correctly because the Greek priest made out this certificate, and he knows how to spell the names in Greek. It's not a clerk in a US courthouse that was trying to do a transliteration. This is the way the names are spelled. Very, very, very important document. 
Okay, so Bertha came back yet again to the INS because look at this, she lost her alien registration card and she needs to replace it. These alien registration cards were as vital to the aliens in 1940 and up to 1944 as our driver's licenses are for us today. We don't leave home without it, it's our ID. Same thing with, with them. Bertha lost her card and she needed to get it replaced. So she had to go back to INS, yet again, fill out another form so she could get her card. Now look here, um, on the lower right, it says conflicted admission date. Uh, she says that she came in on October 28th, 1912, but actually she came in 1913. So here again, Bata signed this, Bertha signed this, see her signature at the bottom. Somebody else obviously filled out the information, but she's giving a different date than she has given on other documents. This here is another document in her file, um, and I pulled it out to show you because here, she is verifying her original surname as being Vulamanos. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you will see uh, her father's name, Athanasios Vulumanos Ancayopi Costas, as her mother. Remember a document or two before, she said her father's name was, on her marriage document, she said her father's name was Thomas Manos. Well, that's not true. This is her father's name, Athanasios Vulumanos. Poor Bertha, she has an FBI file as well. I have no idea why, but she does. And that document is in her alien registration file. Again, it verifies her original surname. It verifies her parents. It gives us um, her date of birth. Uh, I don't have an arrow going to that, but you'll see it sort of up on the upper right-hand side of the screen. It also verifies her husband's name and his birth date. So I think you can see the more documents that you accumulate for your, for your ancestors, the more information you have to synthesize, to sift through, and learn the actual facts about their dates of birth, places of birth, names, what names they were known by, their parents' names, and other information. So let's take a look at this little chart here. I've written down the different forms that we looked at just in this presentation. Remember, Bertha's file is 48 pages. There are many, many, many more documents there. But um, to keep this within the hour timeline, I could only show you a few. So take a look at these different forms, the first names that she used, the surnames that she used, the different dates, and the different places of birth that she gave. So what if I only had one of these documents? What if I only had her petition for naturalization? That petition did not give her full name of Vulumanos. So, I would not be able to go to Goritza and find her. Now we're going to meet another one of my um, extended family members. Her name is Hariklia Bortsu Zaharaikis. She immigrated after 1944, after the U.S. was out of World War II. Her husband was a foreign national in the U.S., and she also has an A file. Remember this chart? Hariklia is this one who is outlined in red. She immigrated to the U.S. after April 1st, 1944. Therefore, she will have an alien registration file. Remember, Bertha was the one who was two squares down. She registered as an, I'm sorry, um, uh, excuse me. Most people are two squares down. They register as an alien, but they never go back to the INS. Well, Bertha came back, which is why she has a file. Hariglia came after 1944, and that's why she has a file. Um, Hariglia's file was not as robust. 
did not have 48 documents, but she had several. And I'd like to show you these documents because they're different than the ones that are in Bertha's file. For Hariglia, she has an immigrant visa and alien registration document that was created in Greece before she came to the United States. So here in the red square, we can see that she arrived by airplane. She did not come through Ellis Island. She came in on TWA flight 901 in 1965. We have her picture and we see that this document was procured at the American Embassy in Athens, Greece. We can see that she came in under a specific immigrant quota. Now, if you remember United States immigration laws, throughout the years, there were different laws that were passed, and that in itself is a whole other lecture. Which law was passed at which time? Who could come in? Who could not come in? And there were quotas that were put on people arriving from various countries. And many of our ancestors and our family members, if they could come in underneath that quota, they would do so. So Hariglia came in under the quota for people from Greece. Let's say that that quota for that year had been met and she could not come into the United States because as many people as were allowed to come in from Greece came in already that year. But let's say she needed to leave her country or she wanted to leave her country. Many people would leave their countries, go to Canada, and stay in Canada for, oh, maybe a few months, a year or two, and then come into the U.S. that way. Because they could come in through the Canadian borders and not come in under these quotas that were set for specific ethnicities. So if you can't find somebody coming in on a passenger ship, have you thought to look at Canadian border crossings? because maybe your people came in through Canada first due to a quota restriction and uh, from Canada emigrated into the U.S. Also here we see that she had a passport. Um, this is a Greek passport, not a U.S. passport. It tells us uh, it was issued to Hariglia Giorgio Sakharaikis. This is not her uh, maiden name. This is her husband's name. You have to know the naming conventions for your uh, country of origin, the people in your country of origin. For Greece, the woman would take on, uh, when, before she was married, she would have her father's name as her middle name. And after she was married, she would take her husband's full name as her name. So she kept her first name, Hariglia, but her name became Hariglia Yorgos Zakharaikis, and Yorgos Zakharaikis is her husband. We can see that it was uh, issued in Laconia on a specific date, 1965. Now, this was completed at the American Embassy in Athens, and take a look at this document. It is bilingual. It is both in Greek and in English. So we can see here the Greek spelling of her name as well as the English transliteration. We can see uh, her maiden name, uh, which I blew up here on the next screen. So let's take a look at this very closely. Her maiden name, you can see it written in Greek. It starts M and then uh, the Greek P, O-Y-P-T-Z-O-Y. And that's the way it's spelled in Greek. In English, it's transliterated to Borges. Uh, it gives us her birth date. It gives us her birth village and it gives us her father's name. Remember on the document that we saw on her passport, let me go back two screens. Whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way, excuse me. Um, okay, here, see how her name is Hariklia Georgia Sakharakis, and I explained that that's not her name. This is her name here, Hariklia Paraskevas Borges. That's the name where I would look for her in records in Greece, because that is her maiden name, and that's what's on this application. Also in Hadiglia's files, I found an incredible document. 
Uh, this was document is called a Pisto Pitico. It is issued in her village of Theologos, Greece. It's an affidavit of birth and residency in that village. It gives us her father's name. It gives us when she was born, that she's Christian Orthodox, her husband's occupation, and of even more critical importance, it tells us that she is registered in the town register of Theologos. She can be found in family 45, number 45, on line eight for that family. Um, these are uh, town registers are like our US census records where it lists the father, the mother, and all the children in the family. So from this one document, I can go to the town hall in her village and I can request the town register for family number 45 and I will find her. This document is of inestimable value to me as a researcher in Greece. Also here, we have her marriage record, but unlike Bertha's, Pariglia was married in Greece before she came to the U.S. So this is a certification from the uh, Orthodox Church with her marriage. Um, it tells us when she was married, where she was married, her husband's name, her name, and of critical importance, it's a second marriage for both of them. Which tells me that Pariglia had a first husband, possibly children by that first husband, and her second husband, George, also had a bride, perhaps he had children from that first wife, and that um, both of them have remarried, so I would have to sort out their children. Which ones are the children for um, Pariglia and her first husband, which ones are the children for Georgios and his first wife, which children are theirs together. If I didn't have this Greek marriage record and I found them only in U.S. records with their children listed, I would have no idea that this was a blended family. Another interesting document is that her husband, George, had to file an affidavit of support proving that he was employed, where he was employed, how much money he made, and guaranteeing that he's going to provide for his wife and children that they will not become what was called back then a public charge. Also on this affidavit of support, you will see George's alien registration number. Now, if I wanted to um, pursue this research on this family more, I could look to see if George's uh, has an alien registration file or not. But I have his number, and that's a huge step for me to move forward with. Now, in order for Hariklia to come in, he had to be sponsored. George, her husband, was already here. And we can see in this document where he was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, he's telling us here where he was born, when he was born, when he came into the United States. Now remember, this is not George's file. This is his wife's file. But information for him is in her alien registration file. So I not only have the information I need for her to go back to Greece and research her, but I now have information for George to help me research him uh, further, both in the United States and in Theologos, Greece. So in conclusion, does your ancestor have an A file? I think you can begin to see how important these are for research purposes. The first thing you're gonna do is check the 1940 census and see if you can find your ancestor and what is their status. Are they AL for alien, NA for naturalized, or PA, P like Paul A, 
meaning that they filed their first papers for naturalization. Even if it has a PA, they were not yet a U.S. citizen, they would definitely have an alien registration number and possibly a file. The other way that you can find out is to do a name search in the National Archives catalog. Uh, the URL is in your handout. You just go to this URL and just type in a name. And if there is an alien registration file, it's, you're going to see what's on the bottom of the screen in the blue box. It says here, alien case file for Irene Kostakos. And it tells you exactly, this is exactly what you're going to see on the National Archives website. This file is an alien case file for Irene Kostakos. This is her date of birth. This is the country that she's listed. That's all the information that you're going to get. They're not going to give you more descriptive information. So this particular person may or may not be the person that you're looking for. You don't know until you order the file. Um, the National Archives identifier information here is what you need when you write to the National Archives and ask for that file. Now, I, what I did was made a list of all the people in my family, because remember, my, both my mother's father and father's fathers um, and mothers, all my ancestors are from the Sparta area. So I had maybe 40 or 45 people, and I could not afford to pay the National Archives whatever fee it was, I believe it was $65, to order all those files. But I made a list. I contacted the National Archives. I found their names, all of these names, just like what you're seeing on this screen. And my husband and I went on a research trip. And we went to um, National Archives in Kansas City. And they had all those files pulled for me, waiting for me. And I spent the afternoon going through them. I could tell immediately by opening the file whether that was somebody who was in my family or not. So if you have several people that you're interested in. When the National Archives reopens, it's a nice little uh, a trip to go. Perhaps you can do a little sightseeing on the way as well. But you can order online, you can go in person, and these files are public information and they're available to you. So consequently, this is uh, these are the details here. Um, if your ancestor was born within the last 100 years, then you would need to write to USIS, which is Citizen uh, Immigration Services. After 100 years, those files are sent to the National Archives. So because my ancestors uh, were born more than 99 years ago, I was able to get their files at the National Archives. If for some reason, the net, you write to the National Archives and they don't have a record for your ancestor, you can write to USIS because there's a possibility that your ancestor may have had an A file and it just has not been transferred as of yet to NARA where it should be. There are some other resources. These are also on your handout. The Family Search Wiki has a terrific article on citizenship and naturalization. And you can learn more about A files on the NARA website and the USIS website as well. In summary, this is one stop shopping for us. If you have an A file for an ancestor, you have just hit the proverbial pot of gold. Um, and almost anything that you would want to know about them would be in that file documents from foreign countries, information about their family here in the U.S., photos, um, and of course, many different documents that you can correlate discrepancies about. This particular picture is my grandmother, and uh, the man standing behind her, immediately behind her, um, is my godfather, and my father and my mother are on the left and on the right. So these alien registration files have been gems for me in learning more about my family history research. And I hope that if you have an alien in 1940 who was in the U.S., you know they've got a number, perhaps they'll have a file, and if they do, I know that you will be most successful 
and finding out much about them to assist you with your research. So thank you very much for the opportunity to give this presentation. Thank you, Carol. That was wonderful. Um, we've already got some questions coming in. Um, Connie would like to know if you could recommend a face group, uh, Facebook group to join for research and possible translation help. Um, yes, there's a fabulous Facebook group called Genealogy Translations. Uh, these are people who will, you upload a, a document, obviously you wouldn't do a book or something major, but most people may upload um, something that they found in a foreign language, and people, volunteers there, will translate that document for you. Um, there are uh, people will do Russian, Hebrew, um, uh, German, almost any, almost any language. So Genealogy Translations is a fabulous Facebook page to use to get assistance from the, from the community. Okay, and then I'll ask the class uh, if they have any questions, uh, go ahead and please uh, type them into the chat box right now. And while they're doing that, I've actually got quite a few questions. <laughs> so I'm okay. uh, perhaps these might be some questions that the class had. Um, what was the most likely, uh, let's see here, hold on. Um, you talked about, you know, coming over in, in, you know, looking at the 1940 census and then, you know, trying to find the records from that point forward or actually that point backwards. But can you tell us about the waves of immigration prior, like right around the 1940 period? Well, most of, well, it depends. Different ethnicities immigrated at different times. And that's a whole other lecture just in, in just in immigration. Who came over when? Um, many people came over from Ireland, as we all know, through the potato famine in the mid-1800s. Um, the, the area, you would need to know what country your ancestors are from, and then you can determine what wave of immigration they came in on. For example, most Europeans came uh, from the... 191890s to about 1920. That was huge for Europe um, and the area that my particular family's from. Uh, others came uh, a little bit before then. There was a lot of immigration from England uh, and the northern part of Europe, more towards the mid to the late 1800s, because there were reasons that people left their country. The reasons that they left are generally economic reasons um, for religious religious reasons economic reasons are the two main ones either there were terrible things going on in their country they were poverty stricken and they had to leave or they were being persecuted for one reason or another um, so consequently knowing the history of the ethnicity of your people is critically important to understand what was going on in their homelands and what pushed them out of their homelands. Why would they leave? Why would they leave everything that they knew and their families to get on a boat and travel across an ocean to someplace they've never been? So you need to understand that. And then once you under, once you pinpoint the country and once you pinpoint what's going on historically at that time, then you can understand those reasons as to why they came. And if they came, others came from their area as well. So we know that the original immigration was from Northern Europe, and then it started to go into Southern Europe to the Italians and the Greeks, um, and the people from the Balkans came a little bit later on, 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930, was basically that, that bulk for that, that reason there. I'd like to kind of put in a, a little um, uh, plug for our library. Um, our library has a tremendous amount of books on uh, the waves of immigration. So if mm -hmm. any of my students are interested in learning uh, more about that when the campus reopens, uh, I'm more than happy to show them where all the books are in the library on the different waves of immigration. We actually have several wonderful sets of uh, uh, immigration encyclopedias in our mm -hmm. uh, history section in our library. Uh, and I think that, that that could actually supplement a lot of their research. Absolutely. Uh, now, now I have another question. Um, now, I know, like, for instance, if you want to get somebody's FBI file, if they're still alive, you'd have to get their written permission to get it. 
but after they're dead, you'd, all you have to do is verify that the person's dead and then you can get the, the file. Now, for these A files, uh, does the person have to be dead in order for you to access their records? Um, most of them would be dead at this point because if they were aliens by 1940, remember they had to be 14 years old or older. So most of them now, many of them would have been born in the early 1900s. This is now 2020. So most of them are deceased. There are instances uh, they do have to look at the files and they, they will redact anything that has to do with living people. So um, there, you when you get a file, you may find black marks through some of the documents that you get. So you're not going to get the original ones. They're going to send you copies. Um, but yes, information on living people can be redacted. But in Bertha's file, it wasn't because it told us the name of her children and where they were living. So and how old they were. I yeah. think I saw two, two redactions in one of your documents. Yeah, we like did. So, yeah, so, um, Hariklias had redactions and Bertha's did not. So why hers did and Bertha's didn't, I don't know. Because Bertha's daughter is, well, she's deceased now, but I had, I had been corresponding with her about 15 years ago before she died. So I don't know. Um, but yes, you can, you, you do not have to have permission to see those documents, those are public documents. But the staff will, or could, if they wanted to, um, black out information that could be on living people. Maybe one of the clerks was a little more fastidious than the other, I can't say. <laughs> now, the one thing I also noticed, um, because of the different you know, dates that they, she said she came in, and uh, says one time she says she knew the name of the ship, and one time she said she doesn't know the name of the ship. Can we go on the assumption then that nobody on the other end was ever checking these against, like, you know, other records to verify that someone was telling the truth or not telling the truth? Well, that's a good question. Um, we know that people had to have a certificate of arrival with their naturalization papers in order to become naturalized citizens. And that um, I right now the date of that escapes me as far as when that went into effect. One of it was one of those immigration laws that went into effect. Um, so how do you prove what's right or wrong? When Bertha, I have my little, I printed out the little chart here. When Bertha's little chart is giving us all kinds of different information, I don't know how much verification actually went on um, because we can see these official documents in her files and every one of them is different. Do they have the staff to check every single person and what every single person says is true? Probably not. They probably just took it at face value. Now, you know, speaking of that chart, I, I found that chart a wonderful tool that, that our uh, students can use not just on uh, the A files, but on many other different kinds of files as well. Uh, would mm -hmm. you be willing to share that with, our, with my students? Sure. A comparison chart? Maybe you can sure. send me a copy, a PDF of it, or, or you know, a Word yes. uh, perfect version? Okay. Absolutely. Um, the best way to do it, you can do it, you just set up a table in a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet, and just, they're, they're fabulous, because what you can do is you can, it, it helps you sort out the, the conflicting information that you have, or even the information that doesn't conflict. And it gives you kind of a one view of everything just right there on a chart so that you can look and see. Of course, I'd be more than happy to send this to you. Wonderful. Um, now, by any chance, did you ever find the ship manifest with her name on it? I did. I did, but I don't have it handy right now. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not no, like it's, right here that, with me. I was just wondering if, if all the information finally came together in the form of a ship manifest proving time and place and date. Uh, yes. Some of it did, some of it did not. <laughs> okay, and then I have another question. Um, so did you ever find out who lived in Philadelphia? I did not. I did. I did not get into that. Um, in, in, in the family, in that particular family, I did not dig into the Philadelphia research yet. No, I did not. 
Okay. And then because my class is a combination of beginning, intermediate, and advanced students, you mentioned FAN. Could you define FAN and talk oh, a little bit about FAN? Sure. The FAN Club is the Friends, Associates, and Neighbors. And that's a term that was um, coined by Elizabeth Schoen Mills, who is a who's a professional genealogist and who specializes in sourcing. She has a couple of books, maybe they're in your library. Um, Evidence Explained is, uh, is her book. And uh, what she talks about is the fact that when you research somebody, sometimes you cannot just research that individual, but that individual didn't live in a bubble. That individual interacted with other family members, with friends, with neighbors, with church people, with other associates. And oftentimes when there was movement, people would go with a friend or a relative or a cousin or a group of people. Um, we see this in American history when people would uh, migrate from one area to another. My husband's family is um, well known for starting out in Pennsylvania and eventually winding up in Missouri. And, and they moved with other people in their, in, who were friends of theirs and sometimes relatives. Meaning somebody would say, you know, I hear that there's land in Kentucky or there's land in Missouri and maybe we should, maybe we should go there. And they're like, okay. So they all sell their farms and they go together. Um, same thing, particularly with immigration. It's very rare very rare to find a person getting on a ship by himself or herself and coming overseas. It, it has happened to two of my ancestors, but most of them came with at least one other person. Or I am finding even several people from their village went on that boat together. So when you research a fan club, what you're doing is if you're kind of stuck on your own particular ancestor, you need to see who did they, who who were their relatives, who were their friends, who could possibly have come over on that boat with them. Or you find their name on a ship manifest, and then you look to see who else is on that ship from their village or from their particular little location. Chances are they knew that person. And if you ever get stuck, and you cannot go any farther on the research on your specific person of interest, you, you can then start researching the person who they associated with or the people they associated with. Because if they were from the same area, from the same town, then there would, there would be links and clues in the research that you find for them that would help you in your own ancestors' research. Um, it's, it's, nobody likes to hear that. I work at the National Archives on Mondays and people come in all the time. They're stuck and they can't find their great grandfather's father. And I'll say, well, have you researched your great grandfather's brother or sister? No, I don't want to spend my time doing that. I just want to find my great grandfather. Well, his records may not be, may not have the information that you're looking for, but maybe a brother or a sister or cousins records do. So sometimes we need to widen our search and, and research other people as well. Excellent, okay. And then you mentioned the children's baptism record um, mm -hmm. from 1925, you know, and something occurred to me. Do you think that that was in there uh, to kind of basically verify for social security purposes? that uh, indeed she was there, you know, in a certain date, on a certain time, in a certain place? Oh, I'm, sh I'm sure when the government, I, I can tell you from working at NARA that when the government is, when you need to get money from the government or you want something from the government, they want you to prove. Every, I mean, so people will just start sending in anything and everything they have to prove a specific fact, to prove that they were resident in a certain area at a certain time, or to prove whatever. Um, uh, I'm going to digress for a minute. I was working on the Civil War Widows Pension Projects. There was an initiative by the National Archive to digitize these records. And just looking at what these people sent in uh, in order to obtain a pension for a Civil War soldier who died in the Civil War or as a result of a wound they, that they sustained in the Civil War, 
people sent in incredible things, the original marriage certificates, original documents from when they first, um, from affidavits from neighbors and friends. I mean, there were no copy machines back then. So if they wanted to get their money from the government, they sent in whatever the government asked for. And these baptismal records, I would imagine, were. But to send in three, that's what shocked me. I could see sending in one, but to send in three, wow, that was a lot. And those were the originals in the files. I was I was heartbroken that they weren't with the family and that they were just sitting in a government uh, government file somewhere. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, now... Um... You mentioned about the FBI file. Um, mm -hmm. Does that document that you saw that mentioned the FBI, does that mean she has a FBI file or does that mean that she just was cleared by the FBI that she did not have a record and therefore could be you know, uh, you know, admitted into the country or staying in the country? That's an excellent question. I don't have the answer. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You can write to the FBI under the Freedom of Information Act. Yes, you can. Uh, and, and get that file if it exists. Exactly. And the Freedom of Information Act is, is a real key. I was going to mention, I'm so glad that you did, um, because if at any point in time people are looking to try to get public documents and they're denied, then they can request those documents under FOIA. Now they have to, you have to do a little research to find out what type of document it is you're looking for and if it is eligible to be released to you under FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, but many are. Many are. So sometimes you can just write a letter and it can be refused. But then if you fill out a FOIA form, then they have to comply with it. And I think if I remember correctly, on the FBI website, uh, there is something called the vault. And mm -hmm. I believe that they're starting to digitize a lot of their old uh, records, you know, so people don't have to make FOIA requests. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, after a certain year, I think they're just, you know, kind of public information. But right. I, I do remember the last time I was on their website, they had something called the vault and it was, you know, you could, anyone could access it just by clicking on it. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, let's see here. Um, oh, once again, this, this is kind of a, a repeat of a, a different question I asked you earlier. With all the click, conflicting arrival dates, um, it implies that once again, no one was checking the ship's arrival records. I find, actually, I find that really kind of fascinating that, that, uh -huh. uh, and I bet you your ancestor was not unique in this. I bet you there were. Oh, no. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why um, I, I just so appreciate having the records in these alien registration files. I actually, when we came back from our research trip um, to Kansas City, um, I, I came home with maybe 15 or 20 files that I had digitized. And looking through them, it's it's true. So many of them are, are conflicting information. And, you know, there's a couple of reasons why. Um, number one, understanding the background that these people came from. Um, in Greece, people don't celebrate birthdays. They celebrate what are called name days. You're named after a saint. And if St. James's Day is February 8th, then, and your name is James, then everybody celebrates all the Jameses on that day. So you don't, many times, don't even know when you were born, okay? Um, the second thing is that it can be a little disconcerting to be sitting in a public office and have a clerk, an official clerk looking at you, an immigrant or an alien, and asking you questions. And it's, it's perfectly understandable that people just get confused or they don't know or they forget, or they think it's one date when it's actually another date. So I, I don't think that this was done on purpose. I don't think people lied on purpose. I think there was just a variety of reasons as to why conflicting information was given. But the point I wanna make in this lecture is that you, have, you really have to find every document possible for your immigrant ancestor in order to be able to know what you're looking for when you cross the pond and go to the other side. And the fact that they came here, like I said, if if I had just had that marriage, the transcript of that marriage, which most of us are overjoyed to have a marriage record, and we look at it like it's it's gospel, it's it's gold, it's gospel because the people there are the ones who gave that information. So it's primary source information. But that doesn't mean it's it's accurate information. 
um, as we see with Bertha when she gave her father's name as Thomas Manos. No way. That was not his name. So that's the point of this lecture. The point of the lecture is not only alien registration files are fabulous resources if, you, if your ancestor has them, but it's so important to try to find any document that could possibly have been created in this country to prove your ancestor's original surname and village of origin. Um, and that's, uh, that's just so important because the last thing you want to do is start researching overseas. Many times that either um, entails a trip yourself overseas or hiring somebody to do that research for you, both of which are very expensive, only to come up with nothing because you don't have the accurate information that you need. Understood. Um, one of my students, I guess, uh, after we just talked about genealogy translations on Facebook, uh, she just wrote down and said that genealogy translations have shut down effective September 12, 2019, according to the Facebook group. Now, I don't know whether that means that they've just renamed themselves something else uh, or whether that actually uh, means that they've shut down for good. That I'm not sure. I'd have to log on to Facebook after your presentation. Oh, I will have to check that out because I refer people to that website, to that Facebook group regularly. Um, that's disconcerting. I don't use it myself personally, but um, I know people who do. No, I don't. Well, I, it's, I'll have to check it out. Definitely yeah, I'll check, check it out, too. And then uh, one last question. Um, now, I know that there's somebody, oh, excuse me, let me just go back a second. Oh, I do know you can't post on that page uh, the genealogy translations unless you're a member. You do have right. to, and you have to get approval to be a member. Um, so right. that one, one of the uh, students just said you cannot post anything on that Facebook page. I just wanted to let them know. Uh, oh, yes, right. she says she is a member. So, so she, it looks like maybe perhaps it may be shut down. So. Oh, that's um, too bad. Also, yeah, because I've actually used that myself, so I, I am very sorry to hear that. But I bet you there's other Facebook uh, pages that would do the same thing. So uh, now also, um, you talked a little bit about Elizabeth Schoen Mills. Could you talk uh -huh. a moment about uh, the uh, genealogical proof standards since that really kind of fits into what your presentation was all about? Mm -hmm. Sure. The genealogical proof standard is a standard that's used by not only professional genealogists, but all of us. And basically, there are, there are five parts to it, but the main point is that you are doing a thorough job in researching as many sources as possible. That you're doing that you're doing a thorough search into the fact that you're searching or the ancestor that you're searching. Um, that you um, you examine any sources that could possibly be created for that individual and that that you you correlate the evidence that you're finding in different sources, which is one way that this chart is very helpful. It helps you correlate what information are you getting from where and that you come to a conclusion and that you write that conclusion. I believe that Bertha was born on this date in this place because these documents are, show that she was, these documents show that she wasn't. The ones that do are more official or there are 10 documents that say give this name and place and only one document that gives the other. I mean, you have to rationalize why you're making that conclusion. Um, the genealogical proof standard is really important for the main reason that we want to be sure that the people that we are attaching to our tree are really our people. So um, we, and this becomes especially important when you have people who have the same name, um, who are from the same area, born about the same time. Which John Doe is really your John Doe? Is it John Martin Doe? Is it John Thomas Doe? Is it the one born in, you know, 1865 or the one born in 1864? How do you know which one is yours? So you want to be sure that your research is accurate because whatever you do, you're going to pass on to somebody else. You're going to pass on to your family. Maybe you'll put it online on a, on a family tree. And other people are going to have access to your work. And if you've done work that's not thoroughly researched and 
thoroughly cite, sorted and cite, citations written correctly, then your research may not be may not be accurate. And somebody else, you could cause somebody else to make mistakes in their research because they're thinking that your research is accurate. It becomes a domino effect. Um, so we really do have a responsibility not only to ourselves and to our, our families, but to people that who come to us and ask us for information because they know that we're the genealogists in our family. We have a responsibility to them to, to do a good job. I think we also have a responsibility to our ancestors because I don't think that Bertha would want to be put on somebody's family tree that's not her that and that's not her family. So and neither would her descendants appreciate that as well. So the genealogy proof standard is to help us to make sure that we're doing accurate research, that we're citing our sources, and that we're coming up with conclusions that are drawn from from good research and good analysis and uh, and to make sure that that we are doing the best job that we can. Now you get into some types of records um, where maybe there are not as many records. Um, maybe you're going back in time, maybe you're going to an area like where my ancestors are from where Oh gosh, I can get a record from 1830 and it's just the name of a man in a village with no other identifying information. How do I know if that's my man or not? I can't start there. I have to start with myself, go back one generation at a time and start building the case to prove that this these people lived in this area at this time. From my research, there were only two families in this village in 1830. And this man who is only a name on a tax record must belong to one of those two families. So you really have to take your research step by step. You start from the present, you work back one generation at a time, you prove everything that you possibly can. And then when you get back to the point where there is little information or scant information, you can at least make a logical deduction as to whether somebody does or does not belong in a specific family. But you can't just jump back to 1800s and try to find anybody with your name. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. And at the National Archives, we have to teach people who come in the proper way to research. And they get a little frustrated sometimes because it's like, well, I know who my grandfather is. I know who his father is. And I'm like, well, okay, do you have I'm a, a shocked at how many times people come in and they do not have a birth, a marriage, or a death record for a grandparent, and they want to go back and find their great-grandparents. I want to find the immigration record for my first ancestor who came over. Okay, well, show you know, let's talk about where you are now and how you work your way back to that ancestor. And they do not have the basic documents to prove that these people are who they are, and also those basic documents give you the clues and information to help you go back one more generation. So um, yeah, we, we just need to be good researchers. We need to, we need to do our due diligence. Uh, the, using that, uh, the, uh, the method that you were just describing, um, sometimes you realize that you have to use a preponderance of evidence. Yes. And uh, that comparison chart, I'd like my, 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 my class attendees uh, to know that that chart could really feed right into that preponderance of evidence that you use, you know, on those sound research methods. And mm -hmm. also, equally important is negative evidence. You know, oh, yes. For instance, if you have two John Smiths that were born in the same town the same year, but different families, you know, you have to use the negative evidence to eliminate, you know, without any kind of a possibility of a doubt, that that one is not your ancestor. Absolutely, absolutely. Negative evidence, I think, is it's a really important research tool. And I know Dr. Tom Jones um, talks about negative evidence, lectures about it a lot. And I wish more people did, because um, once you get past the easy records, like the census records and the birth and death records, and you start getting back to eras where eras where there were no birth records in the United States in the 1800s. So how do you know who somebody's parents are? 
And that's when you start getting into, well, what records are they not in? And where do they not show up? And um, the, like you said, the negative, where, where do, what is not there for them? It becomes just as important as what is there for them. Now you could use that same chart that, that you were just showing to actually mm -hmm. prove a negative case. You know, Absolutely. Not just the positive case, but the negative case. And I, that's why I just, I kind of want to spend a lot of time on that chart that you were showing uh, because mm -hmm. I can see you can either use, like I said, once again, for positive evidence or negative evidence. And equally, both are just as important. Mm -hmm. There are, um, uh, I'm sure that there are out on um, uh, webinars, um, using timelines is also a critical way to keep track of your research. A timeline is very similar to a chart like this. You have your, your years of when things happened in a, as an individual's life, what was going on in that time, and you just chart things out. So um, these types of charts are, are very important. I, I use them very, I use them all the time to try to help me sort out what's correct and what's not correct. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'll give the class uh, one last uh, opportunity to, if they have any questions, uh, please type them into the chat room now. Uh, and if I don't uh, hear from anyone in the next few moments, I'll go ahead and, and uh, thank our guest speaker. So let's just wait just a few moments here. Sure. I don't see anyone uh, typing. Okay, well then I guess uh, other questions have been answered. Uh, one last thing, do you mind if people reach out to you directly? Uh, with you know, uh, I know that uh, your blog was in the uh, information I sent out to everybody. Could sure. they join your blog uh, and and perhaps contact you through your blog? Absolutely, perfect. Could you I mean, more than talk happy. a little bit about that? Say that again. Could you talk a little bit about your blog? Oh sure. Um, because I do research in the Sparta area, I've written a blog, I'm writing a blog called Spartan Roots. And it is, um, I started it basically to, to thinking that I would be posting stories of my family, um, pictures and that kind of thing. But what I'm finding is that it's becoming an educational tool, that I am writing about the things that I'm learning um, the different types of records that I'm, I'm researching in or that I'm paying people to find for me. Um, my research trips, what I've learned in those research trips, and um, uh, just different methodologies. So uh, the name of the blog, I can put it in the chat box. It's um, Spartan Roots. WordPress.com. And um, this is my uh, Spartan Roots One at gmail.com. So I would, you know, I'd be more than happy to answer questions. Um, you'd, I'd love for you to come and take a look at my blog. Um, I know that it is very narrow in its focus, but that's where my research focus is um, in my personal research. Before things opened up for me, um, I go to Greece every summer, although I can't go this year. And um, I've been involved in digitizing and preserving records there and working with a colleague to get into the churches and some of the archdiocese offices and get some records that have been sitting around for 150 years that nobody has ever touched and try to get them digitized and preserved. So this has been, become a passion for me. Um, and uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to do that. But before these opportunities opened up for me, I spent many years researching my husband's family. Um, his mother's English, Irish, German. And they came, many of them came over in the 1700s. So I did a lot of US research. Um, and then my husband's father's family is from the Czech Republic. So that was my first real introduction to foreign records. But now I'm into my own research. So I, I kind of have a wide scope of um, experience just through both U.S. and some, some very specific types of foreign records. I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Wonderful. Well, I hope everybody took a screen capture of that contact information. And if not, I'll, I'll be more than happy to pass it on to them. So with that, I guess that's the last of their questions. And I uh, will say thank you very much. And I will ask everyone, uh, including Carol, that the uh, way to hang up and make sure that you're disconnected from your audio and visual 
off your computer at home uh, is to please click on the red hang up button in the middle of your screen. And once again, uh, I cannot say enough uh, thank yous, Carol. That's been wonderful. Oh, you're welcome. Very educational and very informative. And I, I know that if my class were here in person, they'd give you a big hand. They always do. Well, for thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity. I'll get this PDF for you um, immediately, okay? And you can get it out. Thank you, okay. Suzanne. Bye, everybody. Be safe. Bye.